Hello everyone and welcome to another Directions Mag Geospatial webinar today sponsored by our friends at ASRI. I'm Barbara Duke, Managing Editor here at Directions Mag, joined by our webinar producer Lynette Qualia. If we encourage you to read the latest geospatial news and articles, listen to podcasts, or watch a webinar that you may be missed at directionsmag.com. Today we are excited to have Shannon and Nick with us to uh, talk about some global problems and how GIS can make a difference. I know that's no secret to many of us, but they have got some amazing tools and methods to really make a difference. So Nick, over to you to get us started today. Welcome. Great, thank you very much. All right, thanks for the introduction. So I do wanna start us off by uh, basically going through a brief agenda and covering some of the uh, the main problem areas that we can uh, apply both traditional and spatially explicit methods to solve scientific problems. So we're going to focus today uh, with a couple of examples on clustering, classification, and prediction um, with some specific uh, examples across different technology areas. Then Shannon is going to introduce a new experience that we have in our software for data engineering. And then she's going to close out by introducing a product that we have coming early next year called Geoanalytics On Demand Engine, which focuses on working with and analyzing big spatial data. Hey Nick, how about before you, we dive in, let's sure. uh, quickly introduce yourself so people know oh, sure. who you are. Sure, and sure. We'll, we'll do a quick round of intros. Sure, sorry about that. So yeah, so uh, my name is Nick Inner. I work in product management at Esri, and my, myself and my colleague Shannon both cover the spatial analytics and data science uh, capability area. So Shannon? Yep, and like Nick said, I'm also on spatial analysis and data science. I really look forward to your questions. We have so much content today. Please ask a lot of questions. Nick and I will be writing a blog after to answer any great questions that we didn't get to during the session. All right, back to you, Nick. Sure, thanks, Shannon. Thanks for the reminder. So while there are many, many global problems that need to be addressed, and certainly dozens of analytical methods for doing so, we often find it very helpful to break down these analytical problem sets into three general categories, and those are clustering, classification, and prediction. So before we actually take a quick tour and dive into each one of these with some examples, I do wanna run a quick poll and get some information on uh, what you are all interested in, what your experience is with these. Yeah, absolutely, thanks for sharing that, and thanks everyone for participating, and I think, again, you're certainly in the right place. Like Shannon said, we have a lot to cover, and uh, we wanna kinda touch on some of the high points here, so let's dive right in. So the first problem category that we wanna focus on is clustering. And clustering is really all about grouping observations together based on similarity. And this could be similarity in the values of different observations, it could be in their location, and it could be in sort of a combination of both uh, value and location. So what you're looking at here on the map is an example of density-based clustering which is in this case used to delineate traffic zones based on the density and the location of Waze traffic reports. I'm sure many of you have used Waze to get from point A to point B. So within ArcGIS, we have many, many methods to do this sort of clustering and grouping, uh, some of which again, uh, focus on uh, creating clusters based on similarity and attribute values some of which like density-based clustering focus solely on location, some of our clustering methods are more statistical in nature, and some even incorporate uh, the time element of data into the statistical measures. So we also see many scientists that work with our software, they use ArcGIS and R together for their work, and they draw on thousands of packages for doing things like data wrangling and analytics. Um, there's actually a lot of different clustering packages available in R as well. Now with Esri's R ArcGIS Bridge product, scientists can bring together these rich data science and analytics capabilities of R and sort of mash them up with the powerful mapping, visualization, and spatial analytics of ArcGIS. So in our first demo today, we're going to be looking at clustering precipitation regions using both ArcGIS Pro and R. And actually, the workflow is based on a recent paper uh, that has been that was published, which basically the goal of this paper is to delineate homogeneous precipitation regions in the US based on historical precipitation characteristics. 
So let's pop right over to ArcGIS Pro. And essentially what I did for this analysis was I went to the PRISM data set. It's a data set of long-term climate um, observations. And I downloaded some different rasters showing precipitation data. So these first few rasters that you're seeing here are actually showing precipitation for the first few days of 1981. Now, this is four rasters. For this particular long-term analysis, they're actually required about 11,000 rasters. So what I, what I did was I brought this data into R, okay? And I used R to wrangle the data. And so although we won't have time to get into all of this code, what it's basically doing is it's saying, all right, we'll go and download the different rasters. And it's basically wrangling them. It's extracting information like the date, and from the date, we can extract information such as the season, and we can extract information such as how many days within a certain amount of time period actually received precipitation. And eventually, what I get to here is some summarizations where for each location, we can aggregate the total precipitation and the total number of days of precipitation at a location, say within a season. And we could calculate some other different uh, precipitation measurements, such as uh, how they're distributed over time within these different seasonal windows. So you essentially end up with a time series of, for each location in the US, a time series of 120 seasons of four different precipitation measurements. And we end up essentially with a table where each row is a, uh, is a location. And for each location, you have a seasonal average over 30 years for the total precipitation of different springs, the number of uh, for different seasons, the number of uh, uh, days within a season on average for different uh, seasons, and some different other measurements of precipitation. So using the R ArcGIS bridge, we could actually write this R table directly to a file geodatabase where we could then bring it back into our GIS and do additional analysis. So if we come back to Pro, what we're essentially looking at here is the final data set where each one of these points represents a pixel centroid. You could see all of those different seasonally averaged precipitation measurements. We then went and uh, coarsened this a little bit, so made it a bit of a coarser resolution and then performed a series of statistical tests, such as principal uh, components analysis, as well as some different types of clustering. Principal components analysis was used to reduce the dimensionality of the 16 dimensions into uh, three reduced components. And then on those components, we were able to perform different types of clustering, uh, both k-means in ArcGIS, as well as a spatially constrained type of clustering. And what we then end up with is a map where we could see for 30 years on average, we could see these clusters. And so we can actually compare these uh, hydroclimate uh, clustering precipitation regions to that of a precipitation or a climate region uh, created over 30 years ago. And we could actually see here that um, our results indicate that our new regions are much more homogeneous and have less, less intra-region variability than these original nine, which suggests that these sort of offer a better understanding of the long-term hydroclimate regions in the U.S. So that was a combination of some work in R, some work in ArcGIS Pro, and then uh, creating these uh, new cluster precipitation regions based on 30 years of data. So. We'll come back to our deck here, and we'll get to our second problem category, which is classification. Classification's all about deciding which category an object or a feature or a pixel belongs to based on a training data set. And you'll often see classification in terms of things like land cover classification, identifying change such as forest loss or urban sprawl. In this case, the example shows taking an image and classifying each pixel in an image as a land cover category, such as impervious. Understanding impervious surfaces uh, is, has it, um, benefits for uh, tax, uh, uh, 
tax assessments, as well as for things like stormwater management. Within ArcGIS, we have different examples for classification methods, ranging from traditional statistical to machine learning, such as random forest and support vector machines, which can be applied to feature and imagery data. What you see on the bottom is one GeoAI semantic segmentation. Semantic segmentation is essentially using deep learning convolutional neural networks to assign categories to or classify pixels and images. So to do deep learning in GIS, I'm sorry, in ArcGIS, you essentially have two choices for how you approach it. You could train your own models. We have ways to do that, uh, which basically means that you need to do the work to collect and label the training data, to make sure it's formatted properly, to make sure there's enough of it, uh, to actually understanding how to train and tune the models before you can do inferences or make predictions. All of this, however, does require that you have enough training data, which takes time and resources to acquire. It requires powerful GPUs to do actually crunch through all the training data. And it does require expertise in understanding the algorithms and how to tune them. Now, what we've worked on in the last year at Esri is to create what we're calling pre-trained AI models. This, these, are tr uh, these are designed to make deep learning easier, and their, their goal is to take away some of the more di difficult aspects of doing deep learning. This includes, again, creating the, uh, the, the training data, having the correct imagery and enough of it, actually understanding how to train and tune the models, as well as, as, well as having the compute required. So we see here some examples of the tasks that we have pre-trained models for. Uh, you'll see land cover classification, parcel extraction, building footprint extraction, and so on and so forth. So let's get in and actually see how to acquire some of these pre-trained GOAI models and how to, um, uh, how to uh, gain some uh, workflows for, for using them. A landing page here, and this is a landing page for the ArcGIS pre-trained models. Now these models have been pre-trained by Esri to perform a variety of specific tasks. Uh, specifically imagery related tasks and LIDAR related tasks. They work in, uh, they're trained on specific geographic locations using a variety of different imagery. And the real idea is that these models can be fine tuned to your specific task or geography without you having to do all the things to train it from scratch, right? So you don't have to collect a ton of training samples. Um, a lot of the computation required to you know, train the last layers of the network has been taken care of already, okay? So if we take a look here at land cover classification, you'll see that anytime you click on one of these models, you'll get an introduction. And the introduction will cover, you know, a little bit of background, what the licensing requirements for the software are, what some of the details of the model are, and perhaps most importantly, how you could download the pre-trained model. So if we open this link in the new tab, all 20 of these pre-trained models for these different tasks are available on Esri's on ArcGIS Living Atlas. And you can see here that it's gonna download something called a deep learning package. And this contains a sample of the imagery as well as the, the pre-trained model and several other pieces of information that you need to use these. So in addition to the introduction where you get all this information on each one of these, you could click the link to use the model which walks you through a workflow on how to actually apply it. So it'll say, all right, I just downloaded the model, that's fine. I'll zoom to an area of interest. Now I'm gonna fire up the classify pixels using deep learning tool. It'll ask you, it'll show you how to parameterize the model. And here you'll actually add in the pre-trained fine-tuned model, run the tool and get an output. And again, the idea here is that this has really taken away some of the more challenging aspects of deep learning um, and, and is available for a variety of different tasks, imagery-related tasks and LIDAR-related tasks. So at this time, let's hop into our second poll and get a little bit of understanding of what you're interested in when it comes to AI tasks. Poll number two, please. <laughs> Which geospatial AI task is most interesting to you or most applicable to your work? And you can pick more than one there. Imagery analysis, natural language processing, tabular and feature analysis, time series analysis, 
or 3D point cloud analysis. All very interesting things to do. And give folks just another moment. Click fast and let's get an idea of what's interesting to people. <clears throat> a clear winner uh, at imagery, but a tie between nice. time series and tabular feature analysis and pretty close behind with 3D point cloud. Cool. Awesome. Well, that's really great to hear. It sounds like given that there's 18 pre-trained imagery models, uh, that's a, probably a good place for everybody to start. Uh, but certainly, even outside of these pre-trained models, um, we do have the, I, I mentioned that sort of first workflow, which is kind of do the training on your own. We do have, um, uh, we do have functionality within our Python API and within ArcGIS Pro to do the model training on your own. And those extend beyond imagery and have NLP problems to solve and have text and tabular problems to solve. Uh, so certainly some, some really great things to check out there as well. All right, thanks for the response. So let's get into the last section here uh, on these three main tasks, and that's prediction. So uh, prediction essentially involves making estimates or predictions of a continuous variable. Often, uh, this is often in the form of a regression or an interpolation method. Uh, what you see here is an example of uh, a map of the US where um, we've taken a global climate model and we've actually downscaled a global climate model to make local temperature predictions. Now within ArcGIS, there are many tools and methods available to help solve these types of problems, ranging from geostatistical interpolators to traditional and spatially explicit regression models uh, to highly flexible machine learning algorithms. So one tool in particular that I do want to highlight today is the new presence only prediction tool. Uh, this is new at ArcGIS Pro 2.9, which was just released a couple of weeks ago. And this tool is used to predict the presence of a phenomenon in a geographic area based only on known presence locations of that phenomenon. Um, and it uses explanatory variables to do so. So behind the scenes, this tool uses the popular Maxent algorithm, which is widely used in you know, species distribution modeling and habitat suitability analysis. So for the last demo here, um, I want to show Maxent in the context of predicting, predicting coral reef habitats under different climate change scenarios. So we'll head back to Pro one more time. And what we're looking at here is an area in the South Pacific. Um, and each one of these black dots represents the observed presence of a coral reef. Uh, this comes from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility data source. Now, in addition to these points, um, I've gone out and I've gotten a bunch of explanatory variables. So these are rasters that represent things like the um, minimum uh, sea surface temperature for current conditions, the cloud cover for current conditions, the salinity uh, content for current conditions. And really what the goal here is that is we're going to use these known locations in combination with these um, explanatory variables to help predict the presence of reefs under two future climate um, climate change conditions. So we can essentially download explanatory variables for the present. We could download those same explanatory variables for 2050, 2100, and kind of use those changes in those explanatory variables to predict how coral reef presence will happen over or change over time. So on the right side of the screen here, you see the new presence only prediction tool. It's gonna require some input features. In this case, it is our presence locations of coral reefs. You have an option to fill out your explanatory training rasters, which in this case, I have nine, representing some of those environmental characteristics. Within the tool here, um, you have an option for explanatory variable expansions. Um, this essentially allows you to uh, incorporate additional complexity into the model. Some of the relationships between your presence um, occurrence variable and your explanatory variables might be different than linear, right? So they might be more complex. So um, this allows you to incorporate that complexity. You have the ability to choose different study areas. This is essentially where presence is possible. I also wanna call out this option for applying spatial thinning. 
Um, with Maxent, there's a really important preparation step, which is um, this uh, notion of spatial thinning, which is built directly into the tool. And this is really important because um, it allows you to get a subset of all of your input points based on, say, a distance characteristic, and that's really helpful in reducing sampling bias. Now, I have a couple of other options here. What I do want to call out to you is at the bottom, you'll note on the right here, I've trained my model with all of the different explanatory variables from these present conditions, from the present time. I've also gone out and I've gotten several of the variables from a future time. So I'm training the model with present conditions and I'm being able to predict in the future based on future conditions. Okay, so that's a really important part of this. Now with the tool being run already, we can look here to view the details. It's always important for ArcGIS tools, specifically a lot of the spatial analytical tools to understand the messages, right? And get information about things like the diagnostics, how well you did in terms of your predictions of presence, how you've parameterized the tool. You'll see diagnostics like the area under the curve, um, which essentially is a measure of how capable the model is at estimating presence. You'll see some diag or you'll see some outputs for all of your different regression coefficients, etc. Another important aspect of a tool of these tools is that they also produce a lot of plots and different ways to visualize. So you're able to see the partial response of all your continuous variables and your categorical variables. You're able to look at your ROC plot, um, which is a, a, a often a commonly used plot with classification problems to identify uh, essentially your, your model performance and how well you're correctly classifying um, uh, your, your presence locations in this case. So a lot of great diagnostics. What I think is perhaps most important to show, or one of the sort of end results, is how, how the maps look in terms of prediction. So if we'll turn off our original points, we could see here that the overall presence of coral reefs at the current time period kind of looks like this. So you see a higher presence in the darker red colors. But because we've collected data for our explanatory variables for 2050, we can look at perhaps how that um, uh, how that pre how those presence locations perhaps change under uh, different climate scenarios for 2050, for 2051, etc. So if we just, for example, flip back and forth between the current conditions 2100, current conditions 2100, we see a general decrease in habitat suitability particularly in, in these equatorial latitudes in the next 100 years or so. So, um, and this is potentially due to seawater temperature increases. So um, this is in line with a lot of what's seen out there in the literature, in the research literature, and um, I think is a good uh, application of this new Maxent for you know, understanding these species distributions in uh, future scenarios, under climate scenarios. So important scientific problems. So uh, with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Shannon, and we'll learn about data engineering and big data. Thanks, Nick. All right, let me share my screen. There we go. Share my screen. You should be seeing a beautiful ArcGIS Pro. Are we got it. Seeing? Perfect. All right, but we'll start with some slides. All right, let's start with a little Alice in Wonderland. Why not? Will you, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to go, or where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't much matter where, uh, which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only walk long enough. Now, clearly, Lewis Carroll was talking about data engineering. <laughs> That's what we were all thinking there. But I actually really like this quote around and in, in making when I think about data engineering, because a lot of times when it when it, we approach data engineering, we know that we need to be thinking about the question, the context, where are we trying to get to? But oftentimes the people that we're working around uh, can think that data engineering is a one size fits all task where we can just clean the data and then it's ready for any analysis. And it's just simply not true. And if you try to do that, you will end up somewhere with your data. 
but will you end up with the data that you needed for your analysis? So let's dive in and go down the data engineering rabbit hole. Now, one reason we always love to hate data engineering is because it is time consuming and often tedious, particularly if you have very messy data, data that has poor metadata or no metadata at all. It can be uh, all different types of files. There's really no rules. It can be the complete wild west. And the more wild that west is, the more time it'll take you to paint it. The next thing is it's very uh, subjective. What is clean data? When is that data analysis ready? The question that you're asking and the context of that question matter when it comes to how we clean the data. It isn't one size fit all, like some people might think. Um, as much as we might want to just have interns go through and delete all null values from data so it's clean, null values can also be information and we don't necessarily just want to, to get rid of it. So asking the right question and asking the question right. I had a statistics professor who that was his favorite thing to tell us. Are you asking the right question? Are you asking the question right? Um, is a very crucial part of the data engineering process. And in this, it's important that we realize and recognize that we're manipulating both the data, we're cleaning it, we're deciding what data to keep, what to remove, to, how to transform it, maybe we're encoding it, but we're also interpreting the question. So in this sense, we are both the cat and Alice. And we don't want to mislead, not ourselves or our stakeholders. So I'm sure it's happened to many people here where you've been we're doing an analysis, you go to show your, your stakeholder, your manager, your peer, um, whoever it is, the results of your workflow. And when they look at it, they see that it wasn't what they were expecting. And they immediately say, no, 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 go back and, and, and try it again. I had this happen to me when I was an analyst. I was analyzing uh, traffic incident data, and the person I was working with told me, oh, we always have the most traffic tickets given on 4th of July weekend. You can, you can bet on it. And it wasn't. And so there's that careful balance between sometimes we are the subject matter experts at the data. We, we know what the data is. There's not really room for interpretation. There are other times where we're working with others to be the subject matter expert. For example, if you're working with pipeline data, I once had a pipeline engineer come storming into my office and telling me this data makes no sense. We would never line this type of pipe with this type of metal. And I had no idea what he was talking about. So when it comes to data engineering, the important things are that it can take a lot of time. What does it mean to be clean will depend on your question. And when your data is analysis ready will also depend on that. We don't want to mislead anyone and we have to understand that we are representing the data and the question itself so within ArcGIS we have the ability to do this um, for a long time but a couple releases ago we introduced new functionality a new data engineering experience in ArcGIS Pro that can really accelerate the process so here I have air quality sensor monitors from the EPA throughout the United States to access the data engineering experience, all I do is right click my layer and you'll see there's a new option right under attribute for data engineering. Now I've already populated my data engineering uh, pane with some data, but in case you wanted to see how that gets added, all you do is you can drag a column from the left into the right. You'll notice it gets bold here um, and that's how you know which data is in this table. And if you wanted to remove it, you simply go to the row and you remove the field. Now, what this does right away is tell us a lot of information about our data. We can see a di the distribution, so a quick histogram of the data. We can also see how many nulls we have. So off the bat, we knew this was air quality data coming from, from monitors. And so we might think without, if we never even looked at this, great, we can use this to understand all different pollutants. Uh, we could look at ozone and NO2, carbon uh, monoxide. But as we look at the nulls here, we can see that really, for a lot of these, we have a very high percentage of nulls, 80%, 86%. Now, do we want to just get rid of that data? Well, that depends quite a lot. Maybe this is just one state of that data. Maybe this is just all of California sensors, for some reason, were not giving us carbon monoxide but the rest of the data is good. Maybe we can get rid of that. Well, to find out the distribution, we can simply right click that null 
and select it. And here we see that it is not one isolated state of bad data or one geographic region of sensors. It's everywhere. So in truth, this data is really only good for helping us understand the fine particulate matter as a pollutant. But when we look at this data itself, we can see that it's a little bit skewed on the distribution. So by right-clicking that, we can open the histogram and further understand this chart. And we'll dock this over here. Thank you, Pro. So here we can see um, uh, what a normal distribution would look like. Here's how our data looks, and we still have that null data selected from um, that other data set. And we can explore more in this way. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to point you to some more resources where you can dive in deep because we have some really great examples of diving really fine into this data engineering experience. One of my favorite is from Lakeisha Coleman here. So if you just go to YouTube, search data engineering Esri, you can find a lot of these great resources. Lakeisha's demo here, I absolutely love. I also love Ankita's from our plenary the, at UC 2021, where she walks through the workflow. You can also find one of the lead engineers on the product, uh, Lynn Bowie, giving a walkthrough back when it was in a preview stage. And if a GUI type interface is less your speed and you're looking for ways that you can uh, still do data engineering through data frames and the Python API, Mohit and Andrew from our Python API team did an entire uh, technical workshop where they dived into that. So that is another video that I would recommend if you're a strong Python user. All right. So with this, you can see there's lots of options. You could standardize, transform, reclassify. Um, we have a ribbon up here where you can have quick access to tools to clean, construct, integrate, format. And it isn't that these weren't available before. For example, for integrate, you can see there's spatial join. Of course, spatial join was available before, but now all of the tools are at your fingertips. So this will greatly accelerate the process and help you be able to understand what questions you can ask of the data that you have available and can help you understand when you might need to go back to the drawing board and ask for more information, more data, so that you can create an analysis that is representative of the problem that you're trying to solve. Now, let's jump back into slides. There's another big type of problem that I want to talk to you about. And it isn't big in the sense of time consuming the way that data engineering will, because I'm sure everyone's heard the statistic that people will spend anywhere between 60 and 80% of their time cleaning data. The other side of the problem I wanna to talk to you is about big data itself. And here at Esri, we have spent the last year-ish working on a new product called ArcGIS Geoanalytics On-Demand Engine. And this is all about bringing big data analytics to data science environments. So before I dive into the product itself, let's think about a big data pipeline, a really simplified version, and what you might be used to seeing it from Esri today. So you'll notice that everything says ArcGIS, and typically you, and, and this is absolutely true, there's nothing wrong with this. Um, today you could do workflows where your raw data is stored in ArcGIS, you're doing your compute in ArcGIS, your prepared data, whether that's results or just data that you've cleaned through data engineering, is also in ArcGIS, and then you are, use ArcGIS to communicate or do further analysis, meaning that you use ArcGIS to put it in an app that people might interact with, for example, during COVID, the Johns Hopkins University dashboard uh, became very wildly popular, used by people all around the world, great way of communicating that information and data. Or you could bring the data into something like ArcGIS Pro and work and do more fine grain, more detailed analysis, like some of the stuff that Nick showed earlier. But when it comes to big data, there's a little bit of a problem with this pipeline. And that's that Oftentimes in organizations, big data does not always start and end in ArcGIS. In fact, there are many other places that big data can enter the picture. So you'll have data lakes that live in clouds. You might have uh, flat files that have lived in your organization for forever and are now just piling up. You need a distribution mechanism. So how are you going to distribute that compute and that analysis so that you can shard that data so you can process that in a distributed or parallelized method, depending on where you're actually running. Uh, Spark is a very common way that you can do this. Um, and there are many ways that 
things can contain Spark. So for example, if you're working in uh, Amazon, EMR, uh, Elastic MapReduce from Amazon, uh, is a way that you could access a Spark environment that's running in a cloud. Likewise, Databricks runs on all major clouds, Google Cloud, Azure, AWS. Um, and then in Google, you have Dataproc. In Azure, you have uh, Synapse Analytics. And all of these providers continue to work on creating more. So there's lots of options for how you're going to distribute it. And once you have that Spark environment set up to distribute the workflow, inside that is where you're actually going to do the analysis, the data engineering, and the machine and deep learning. Because fundamentally, the type of analysis or data engineering that you're trying to do doesn't change just because the data is big. What changed is how you're able to do it. Because when your data gets to be a certain magnitude, you just can't open it up in Excel and try to churn through it. Or you can't bring it into a pro project and be able to work through it. You need something bigger. Um, but what you're trying to do, the question that you're trying to ask hasn't changed. For prepared data, a lot of times when we're working in big data pipelines, you're wanting to write that out into a data warehouse. Or if you are following things like Databricks, you'll know that there's now data lake houses. It bridges the best of both worlds between your data lake and your data warehouse, which in case you are wondering, really what is the difference between a data lake and a data warehouse and why do I care? Data lakes, you can think of as just being a great repository for, for data. It can be unstructured data, it can, you have blob stores, you can fit all sorts of things in a data lake. But when it comes to using it for analysis, that data lake can easily become a data swamp. It can become very messy, it can become difficult for certain applications, particularly BI applications, to work against the data lake. That's where the data warehouse comes in. So a data warehouse would be, examples would include things like Snowflake or BigQuery, um, Redshift, lots of examples of data warehouses out there. Um, and those are really optimized for being able to be used by higher level applications like BI applications and things where you're expecting more structured data. All right, so this product that I'm gonna talk to you about fits in the white box under compute. It's running in your, in your Spark environment and it's an analysis tool. And what it does is it's a cloud native Spark native offering of ArcGIS Analytics, meaning that you can access your data wherever it lives and you run your analytics directly in your Spark environment. So if that means you're using Google Data Proc, more power to you. You're running your analysis there. If your data is all in S3 buckets and your organization's in the, AM, in the AWS, fantastic. You can run this in EMR or Databricks on, on Azure, or AWS, sorry. Likewise, if you're in Azure, Databricks or Synapse Analytics works perfectly fine. You don't have to move your data to an existing ArcGIS product to be able to use this. Now you take your analytics where your data lives. These analytics are also ready to use. When it comes to big data analytics, if you've done any looking out there, you'll notice that a lot of the open source options do ask you to index or transform your data. So you're going to be doing some prep work before you actually can start performing analysis. And sometimes this prep work can be quite time consuming and frustrating depending on the level of familiarity with spatial. So I would imagine for lots of people on this call, you're very familiar with spatial. So the idea of getting data into a spatial format, working with it comes very easily. But if you have data scientist peers for whom spatial is new, this creating the index and realizing everything that we already know about projections and transformations and data can be frustrating. So the good thing with these analytics is that you don't have to worry about that. You can just use your data. You can use Python or SQL to build models and get started. And then you can write results back wherever you need them to be. No black boxes, no having data stuck somewhere where someone can't get it. If you need that data in Redshift, it's in Redshift. If you needed it back in your S3 bucket, it's back in your S3 bucket. Anything that Spark can connect to, you can write to. Um, and also, you can write to GIS format, meaning you can get this information back into ArcGIS if you wanted to do deeper analysis in Pro, or if you had to, if you wanted to populate an app with this data. So it's completely up to you. Now in the first release, we focused on 16 analysis tools. You can see them here. They're really the bread and butter anal analysis tools that people are looking for with big data. A lot of spatial big data workflows right now are really, it, 
at the, I would say, simple stage if you're a spatial person. It's over uh, point and polygon problems, being able to just summarize data, but being able to summarize it at a much, much higher scale than what we're used to in just a typical uh, desktop application. You also, we asked it a little bit of pr uh, prediction in here. We do have some geographically weighted regression, which can be a great way to perform a regression analysis with less dimensions when geography is a factor here. Um, so if you put geographically weighted regression head to head with uh, a more traditional regression technique, um, maybe just a basic linear regression, uh, geographically weighted regression will, will win every time when geography is a factor. Then we added tools that uh, have become very popular with big data workflows, particularly around supply chain, around things like COVID, so that find dwell locations, reconstructing tracks, find trace proximity events, um, which is contact tracing. So all of these tools are available in uh, through using Python. But in addition to that, you have over 100 spatial functions which will help you do things like construct new data, whether that's creating points, lines, or polygons, assessing your data, finding out what is the area of this data that you're looking for, what is the you know, length, the max x, y, um, where's the centroid, you can do that. Operations, which are almost like what you would expect for spatial analysis, but they're, as a function, optimized to be able to work in that Spark environment very, very quickly. So you can do things like find an intersection, do a union. You can also have relationship tests. So this is going to return a true-false. Is this point in that polygon true or false? And of course, you can do binning as well. Square bins, hex bins, polygon bins. You can see some examples of that on the left. So with this product, you can actually create plots in the data frame. Why do you want to do this? Well, one reason that you want to do this is because you want to see what the data is looking like as you're going along. Big data workflows can be time consuming. When you're working in distributed environments, they can go a lot faster, but you want to make sure that you're on the right track, that the data is looking like you're expecting it to look before you have created an entire model and run everything through it. And so being able to do quick, Data frame plots is a very helpful way to do that. And the best part about this is that rather than come up with a whole new plotting mechanism that um, someone would have to learn from scratch, we built on top of Matplotlib, perhaps one of the most popular plotting uh, libraries available. So if you're working with a data scientist who knows how to use Matplotlib, or if you yourself are, then being able to create these very quick spatial plots will come very easily to you but you're not limited to that. Once you have created your analysis and gotten your data into a more uh, aggregated format, so you have smaller, you have now your results set, those can be brought into either your favorite BI app or service. So the example you see there is AWS QuickSight. It could just as easily be Tableau or uh, Looker, whatever it is that you want there. You can bring it into ArcGIS, so you see one example of uh, bringing data into ArcGIS Pro. You can bring it into WebGIS applications or even custom applications that you're creating. It doesn't have to be a specifically GIS application. Because in a lot of the questions that we're asking with big data, sometimes the end isn't, in, isn't specifically spatial, but spatial is a crucial part of solving that problem. And that's what this product's really all about. Now the data sources, like I mentioned, are a lot. Anything supported by Spark, we can support as well. In addition to that, you can bring in shape files, you can read in feature services. So if you have data in an ArcGIS Enterprise deployment or an ArcGIS Online organization that you're wanting to be able to access, you can read those in and you can write back out as vector tiles. So if you're wanting to be able to populate applications um, and be able to work from there, that's fine too. And you can use the ArcGIS API for Python to write into uh, many other additional spatial formats. Now, I know there's a lot of information there, and you're probably looking at these and going, this is so exciting. I hope that's what you're thinking. Um, now, just because we can read it in, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll call out one that people ask about all the time. They see Neo4j. They know that's a graph uh, database. Does this do graph analytics? No. You did not see any graph analytics on the, the chart there or on the list that I gave earlier. But what it means is that if you had spatial data in a graph database from Neo4j, you could bring it in. Once it's in a data frame format, you could use it in analysis. You also will notice that these 
data's inputs and outputs um, range different cloud environments. So you might be wondering, can I blend these together? Could I take data from S3 and you know use it alongside stuff from Cosmo DB? Yeah, you can. Now, one thing to keep in mind when you're blending data across cloud environments is latency of that workflow. It's not impossible to do, um, but you will want to think about what cloud regions you're in and how far this data is apart, because that can potentially slow down a workflow, but still possible. And of course, GeoAnalytics On Demand Engine will write back to any connector that supports write. So if you needed to get this back into, let's say Snowflake, you are absolutely able to do that. What it looks like when you use this product is a Python notebook type interface. All of the major uh, Spark environments that are built into cloud, remember this is a cloud native product first, have a notebook interface that you use to drive it. So the example here is uh, EMR, but in here, I can put that on there so you can re remember that. But whether you're using Databricks or Synapse Analytics or Google Dataproc, they will still have a very similar look and feel. The point to take away here, though, is that there's no click button GUI. There's no way around it. You have to know Python. You, any of the SQL functions you can, uh, or the, the spatial functions, you can use SQL for as well. So if you're a strong SQL user, you might like that option. Um, but you do have to know how to code. Out of the gate, uh, we'll be supporting uh, Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud. Um, Databricks in all three environments, EMR and Dataproc, and actually we just uh, passed our certification on Synapse Analytics, so I need to update this slide to add that there. Um, so you will see that, and I've mentioned that to you a couple times. But let's see it in action, because I think that is a great way to look at it, and I'm just gonna walk through this um, quickly, because the second part of this demo does take uh, 20 minutes, which we do not have. So here we are in EMR. Um, what we do is, this was using our internal dev name of the project, which was Geo Analytics On Demand Engine, Geode. Um, your module will be called Geo Analytics. But you can bring in the function just like you would expect anywhere else. We bring in matplotlib, because remember, that's how we power our plotting. Um, you can use it, like, so we're going to bring in all the spatial functions here, list those out. You can list all of the tools. Those were the tools I listed for you. And now let's jump into a, a demo here. So in this demo, we have a 14 gigabyte CSV file, 25 million records, and this is 311 data. So for anyone joining us from outside the United States, 311 is our non-emergency incident type data. So a noise complaint, someone using fireworks, somebody didn't pick up their trash, whatever it is, you can call 311. Now, what we were wondering is, when COVID hit and everyone had to do outdoor dining in a densely populated city like New York, did the number of noise complaints increase in 2020 versus previous years? Now, what you're seeing here is in Spark, you can get the, uh, the status of a job as it's running. So you can see that happens very quickly. Uh, we were able to get the data from these 25 million records before I even finished telling you what 311 was, essentially. Um, and we were able to bring in and create the spatial information to that. Next, we will add geometry to the data frame. So we're zooming in on that. So we're giving, passing the latitude and longitude. And let's watch that plot real quick. So we're going to create a quick plot so we can see where these noise complaints are uh, showing up in the state uh, or in the city of New York. So oh, we're going to look at the data more. Sorry and then we're going to plot it. Let's plot. There we go. And it happens almost instantly, that plot. But again, blue blob of points, not very helpful. We can see that this is roughly the shape of the city of New York, and that's about it. So what we would want to do is do some binning. So what we're going to do is bin all of those 25 million uh, complaints into hex bin. And you see how quickly that was able to run in this Spark environment. Um, very, very quick work here. You can go through, um, we just do some further analysis in there. We can bring in the polygons. So we brought in polygons for a feature service. And now let's join our noise complaints with that. So we can see here's our feature service that we brought in. And now let's create a, our kind of a, our cheat at a chloropeth map 
because this is just a quick plot. It, it it's just using Matplotlib behind the scenes to do it. Um, let's jump down to that cell. There we go. It's going to take it a little bit longer here because we're joining about um, just about 200 polygons and this 25 million points. So it'll take it a little longer than the instantaneous um, work that we saw before. So here is the table of the data. So we can see uh, 2010 on the left, 2020 on the right, and you can see big changes in um, certain neighborhoods. You can see, you know, here this one was just uh, 471 complaints back in 2010. Now we're at almost 5,000 complaints, noise complaints in particular. And then let's go ahead and plot that in our quick plot. So we already created the table and give it a second. It's going to go. And then we're going to jump to the next demo real quick here, um, just so you can see how that works. But there you go. So now we were able to find one outlier neighborhood that has much higher noise complaints than anywhere else um, in the city of New York. You could then write that out to a BI application. So there's the results in it coming into a BI application, um, and you could work from there. You can also bring results back into ArcGIS. So here's an example where we do that. We're still in EMR. This time we have marine cadaster data. We're looking at where ships are dwelling. This is a massive data set. So you can see here we have about 2 billion um, points here, almost 3 billion points that we're looking at for this, this ship data. We're going to try to find point clusters and ultimately create uh, standard deviational ellipses so that we can see the distribution of where these ships are dwelling. Running this analysis takes about 20 minutes to crunch through those 2.8 billion records. But what you get as a result is something that you can bring in here. So you use the standard deviational ellipse. You can create those locations. And then in Pro, you can overlay that with a marine chart, which let's bring that in. And you can see our ships dwelling where they're supposed to be. So inside the green circles, yes. Are there ships that are dwelling outside where they need to be? Where are those? We actually did this demo before all of the um, supply chain <laughs> issues with ships sitting out at port, but it would be very interesting to rerun this and see where um, those ships are idling out in port. So let's jump back to slides. That was a crash course in GeoAnalytics On Demand Engine, basically a way that you can take your ArcGIS analytics to an external Spark environment, run your analysis, get your results where and how you need them. So my question for you, our final poll of the day, is are you interested in the beta? Here is the link for the beta. You can just copy, look at this, write it down. If you say yes, we will just send you this link. Um, so we won't, we won't pester you too much. What to know about the beta is uh, we, we are just, we've just opened it up. Um, you will get, it's through the Esri Early Adopter Community. I do ask that you um, fill out a survey to get started in that. So what the survey is going to do is just let us know what environment you're working on, give us an idea of the type of data that you're working on. We are not going to uh, do anything with that other than I, as the product manager, will follow, or Nick uh, um, working with me, will follow up to make sure that uh, you're able to be successful solving the problem that you want to solve. So we're going to be working very closely to make sure that you are successful, that you're meeting the SLA that you wanted to meet, and you're getting where you need to get. And with that, we have just a little bit of time left for questions. Um, so yeah, let's take a look. Absolutely. Uh, so why don't we start with... Um, can you provide some hardware requirements for doing image and LIDAR point cloud classification? Yeah, sure thing. So I can, yeah, uh, I could actually take a couple of, a couple of these questions that sort of popped in in one shot, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so the one thing that I did show, and we could provide some resources, um, when we went to the pre-trained models, there was uh, basically these, this landing page that had individual, um, that had basically you know a workflow guide on how to use each one of them on that workflow guide there is a section that points you to what your requirements need to be one of the requirements is that you download and install something that we have called the deep learning installers 
again, it's all linked. It's basically a GitHub page. You download this um, this installer. It dumps a whole bunch of Python packages into your pro Python environment. Things for deep learning like PyTorch and FastAI and TensorFlow. Um, on that page, it also does provide a whole bunch of requirements for hardware, um, for your CUDA, um, drivers, um, all that is taken care of. We also have a few blog articles that highlight that as well. So those could be all in follow-up resources. And I would like to add, just when you're working with the pre-trained models, you, most likely just using your regular uh, pro machine that you, is just your average desktop, unless you have a really high-end one, is probably not gonna cut it. You do wanna have a GPU behind that. Um, and you, you, the more, the, the better the GPU you have, the better experience you'll have in getting those to run quickly. Um, a good indicator if you don't have a strong enough GPU or if you don't have a GPU that's compatible will be you try to run a pre-trained model and it just looks like it's running and running and running and running and running and running and running and, running and nothing's happening. And you'll see that status bar keep jumping back in time. So it'll look like it's making progress and it'll jump back to, you know, one or two percent. If you observe that behavior, odds are it's probably your GPU. So then uh, take a look, look at those uh, resources that Nick mentioned. But um, that is a good tell of, oh, maybe I, maybe I need a stronger GPU. Yep. Thanks, Shannon. Um, I just, and then just sort of on this topic, two more quick ones. Um, basically, the question is, is it, let's say I have a pre-trained model that will identify palm trees, right, from, from imagery. Can I apply that to a different other type of tree? Well, I think it's one of those things where you just kind of need to try. However, um, within one of the tools that we have, there is a tool called Train Deep Learning, tra Train Deep Learning Model, which there is a parameter in that tool that you could specify if you already have a pre-trained model. So essentially, what that will do is allow you to fine tune essentially the last layers of the network to a smaller, uh, to a different area with just a smaller bit of uh, 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 training data. So for example, you have a model that's trained on palm trees. You could use that pre-trained model in a model that's training on uh, oak trees or something like that. You might just have to create a few training samples for oak trees, specify in the tool to, um, that you already have a pre-trained model it will then retrain those last that last layer on um, the new imagery, smaller image subset, and uh, make fine and fine tune adjustments on that. So there is a parameter for that. Last question on epochs: um, How many epochs should I use for uh, for deep learning training? Just as a quick review, an epoch is essentially, you know, I've trained a model for 10 epochs. That means that the network has seen the training data 10 times, okay, and that's what it's using to learn from. And so, in short, there's no great answer. It really depends on how much time you have. In theory, if you give a deep learning neural network enough good data and you let it train long enough, it'll basically figure it all out, right? It'll converge and it'll get everything right. Now, we don't have time to do that. So um, aside from that, you just kind of, kind of pick an arbitrary number and then you can look at the training and validation, validation loss. So you could actually plot the loss on your validation set as you go through epochs. If your model keeps improving and the accuracy keeps getting better, then keep adding epochs, it's gonna keep getting better. What you wanna watch for is when that validation loss starts to, uh, starts to increase and get worse, that means that you're overfitting the training data set, that means that you're memorizing the data, which means that you're not going to get great predictions anymore. So it's a little bit of an art, a little bit of a science, try it out, depending on how much time you have, and watch those um, loss uh, diagnostics and error uh, metrics. And in the ArcGIS API for Python, there's also a learning rate finder that you can use to help pick a learning rate. And I've talked to uh, our head of R&D for our GUAI products on, on this question of the number of epics. Can Because I was, just, just tell me, what, what's a good number? And the team in our, our R&D center uh, usually starts with about 15, but like Nick said, there's no no right or wrong. You're going to want to run it. The learning rate finder and in the Python API um, can do early stopping. So if it starts to detect some of the loss is creeping up, it'll it'll just stop for you, and and um, you won't have to spend extra resources on the training there. 
And I just wanted to add one more thing on the on the kind of transfer learning and uh, retraining a model for new data sets. Just with any deep learning model, um, it was trained for a specific workflow. So if you start looking for a different type of tree, will you have some percent of accuracy? Sure, because a tree is still a tree, but it won't be the same as if you trained a model on it. Now that's kind of a different problem from training on one geographic area and moving to another one where let's say you were classifying buildings in Chicago and then you wanted to take that and use it in a rural African village. Obviously you're going to have different resolution imagery there, you're having different architectures, you're having different things to look. So you can expect that if you take a model designed for one use and you move it somewhere else, will it get something right? Sure. Will it be as good as if you created the model for that intended purpose? Probably not. Likewise, even if you have a model that's trained for, let's say, detecting aircrafts that are sitting on the ground. If that model was trained in the spring when it's sunny and green, and you're trying to use it in winter where there is a lot of snow, you can expect a, a challenge there. And some of that might seem obvious, but these are questions that come up all the time um, when it comes to, to AI models and, and how, how to use them. Can you shortcut things? How are they working? What do you look for? So just keep those, those things in mind. Uh, we're, we're over time. Um, let's see. Uh, one question I'll take on just the 311 demo. Uh, with GeoAnalytics On Demand Engine, we will be including samples. So that 311 demo, I think, is going to be one of them. Uh, if you join the beta, we can, I'll share that as a resource there. So that way uh, you can access that along with all of the jar files and Python wheel that you'll need to be able to actually rerun that demo in your own environment. Um, all right, uh, Barbary and, and yeah. Direction Magazine team, did, did you want to do any last ones and, or sign out? <laughs> well, I, I think we're, um, we're well over time, but um, we've got lots of yes. good folks still hanging out with us, and we appreciate them being here. Also, <clears throat> just a reminder that we will be in touch in your inbox with a recording as well as a link to your attendance certificate. Also, just know that there is a nice, healthy list of resources and links coming your way as well. So uh, lots of great information for you to continue learning more about this and implementing this in your personal workflows. So we appreciate your opinion on the brief survey on the way out. Thanks again to Nick and Shannon for sharing their expertise as well as their support team. And we hope that you'll just go out and have a great day and tell a friend about Esri and Directions Magazine. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone.